Welcome to Cover to Cover Book Beat. I'm your host, Roger Nichols. Our guest today is one who has taken the road less traveled, and that has made all the difference. For nearly four decades, Lee Woodman has served the art world and literary arts community as a museum pioneer, educator, businesswoman, and writer. From being an award-winning public radio producer at the Library of Congress and an award-winning multimedia producer at the Smithsonian Institution, to her philanthropy and advocacy for the arts and her writing of award-winning poetry books. Woodman has used the power of words and images to educate and enlighten others. She has a mantle we understand is in danger of collapsing from all the awards displayed on it and from her work in multiple media. And she's here today to talk about her latest collection, Artscapes. We're very pleased to welcome Lee Woodman. Good morning, Roger. Uh, what a delight to have you. I, I love writers who send me to dictionaries and other reference books. Now, most people, I am guessing, know just a few things about the types of poetry. They may a limerick, perhaps a Shakespearean sonnet, maybe a haiku. But in Artscapes, you've presented a collection of, I'm hoping to pronounce this correctly, ekphrastic poetry. Help exactly. us out with the definition of that term. Ekphrastic poetry is about all different art forms, um, paintings, sculpture, it can be music, it can be dance. And there have been many, many poets through the uh, centuries that have written about artworks. Um, people like Sylvia Plath and William Carlos Williams and contemporary writers writing today. And um, it's fascinating, but what I love about it is it shows a continuity between different art forms. Mm -hmm. uh, you have included, I think, in this collection, uh, uh, poems inspired by painting, sculpture, music. Are there other types of art you'd like to do this with? I'm thinking plays, movies, performance art? Yes, and as a matter of fact, it's funny that you should mention that because I've just been uh, recently to um, an exhibition at the Hirshhorn Museum at the Smithsonian and it, it profiles Laurie Anderson's work and oh. she's worked in audio, radio, television, dance, film, and it encourages me to think about the third dimension again. So maybe some poetry along with sculpture and some choreographic uh, parts to it too. So I love that question. Oh, thank you, uh, thank you. And I must ask, ask, did you set out to start and say, I'm gonna do an ekphrastic collection or are these things you've written through the years you just pulled together to make this collection? Interesting. Um, it's actually my fourth book, and each book has had a very different theme. This book I did plan to write um, all ekphrastics, and I had written some already, but um, I sent a, a small collection to a publisher, and she said, do you think you would like to do a full collection? And uh, that was uh, Christine Cote from Shanti Arts Publishing. And I said, I would love to. So I took a couple of more months and filled out a full collection and went to not only uh, major museums, but also galleries and street art and listened to different radio programs and got a lot of new ideas. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Um, have, you've mentioned you've written, obviously, uh, before. How was your poetry evolved from the time you began? Ha. Well, my writing story is kind of an interesting story. I've been writing all my life. And during my career, um, I did, uh, gosh, radio writing, television writing, um, writing for exhibition scripts and business writing, too. But when I retired from the Smithsonian uh, seven years ago, I decided that I want to really get back into the arts because I had an art and dance and theater background. So I, a friend of mine said, Lee, I think you'd like to take this memoir course at the Writers' Center in Bethesda, Maryland. And I looked at the catalog and I saw their list of poetry offerings. And the first one that caught my eye said transformation. And when you go through a, a retiring or a rewiring, as I would say it, <laughs> um, you know, there are words that kind of ring in your head and transformation really rung in my head. And the teacher, Judith Harris, was extraordinary. And I just went on from there taking class after class and different states in different uh, ways and I've been just very fortunate to have uh, as many collections published as I have by different independent 
presses. And so I, ha I feel like I have to keep learning, Roger. <laughs> we all do. Yeah, yeah I think so. Uh, when you're composing, do you think about the intended audience or are you composing more to just the piece itself? Because I'm thinking you could, poetry, you have to make so many discrete choices because you have such a, unless you're doing an epic, you have a very limited range to get through that point across. So I'm curious about the thought process there. Two different ways. Um, when I'm writing for myself, which is uh, the most kind of writing that I do, I think more about the content and uh, the ideas come from everywhere. I've been especially interested in different kind of landscapes. And sometimes I mean geographical, sometimes I mean cultural, and sometimes I mean landscapes of the mind and imagination. So the topic could be anything from uh, a cold winter, in the mountains of New Hampshire to um, a city pigeon to uh, dreams about um, anything um, to nature, water, oceans. And then I, I stare at whatever it is. I go and try to be in the presence of whatever it is, whether it's a red tailed hawk or, um, you know, ocean waves running up the beach. And I, I write down a lot of details in a little notebook. I, I just write uh, descriptions, words, thoughts. And then usually I go back and research quite a bit. Uh, you know, if I don't know anything about red-tailed hawks, I'll learn about their nesting habits and their <clears throat> mating habits and the temperatures that they like and so forth. And then I go back and look at the notes and I highlight the hot spots or, or the phrases that rattle for me. And after that, I decide on the form of the poetry. Is it more a free verse poem or is it a villanelle? Is it something that is based in a musical form or is it um, very tight like a haiku or very specific like a sonnet? Mm -hmm. And then I do. In terms of teaching, I think of the audience. I think of first the audience in the classroom, uh, but also, you know, uh, if there are adults, you know, what things adults might be interested in, what things young children might be interested in. And um, what's thrilling is I found that there is such an upsurge, an uptick of people not only reading poetry, but wanting to listen. And I think part of that has to do with um, certainly social media and also with hip hop culture and the absolute thrill of performance competitions where uh, readers and writers actually memorize their works and then they think about the delivery of it on stage and there's a lot of audience interaction and that has really grown poetry enormously. Uh, the, the poetry slams, for instance, and uh, some of the, the tale telling on public radio, uh, the Moth Radio Hour, for instance, is that sort of thing. Uh, interesting, interesting. I want to get you to recite for me because it's, a, you know, it's always a pleasure to tell a teacher to recite uh, if you're a student. Uh, and as an old once upon a time DJ, I was particularly drawn to your poem about the willow after Stevie Wonder's Superstition. I'd love to hear you read it. Okay. Well, I was thinking about a couple of things. First of all, the wonderful rhythm of his work and also about the content. You know, what is it that superstition is for all of us? And what is it specifically uh, for me? And uh, a lot of that has uh, to do for me with finding out ways to overcome fear of superstitions. And it um, was also written during the pandemic and um, I found myself noticing trees more and more and insects and squirrels and they really took over the world. <laughs> so here we go. Stand under a willow inspired by Stevie Wonder's superstition. Stand under a willow, protect yourself from harm. Stand under a willow, breathe in scented balm. Canopy to shade you, branches green and strong. 
graceful boughs to shield you, banish all that's wrong. Nightmares cannot kill you, pain will dissipate. Bend into the tempest, wave bad ghosts away. Willow sways with wind song, soothing as a lyre, harbinger of sweet spring, always first to flower. Tune in sounds of insects, worries disappear. Trust the tree will linger, long roots absorb fear. Some have sipped the nectar to make a healing brew. Learn from their traditions, change your point of view. Birds line nests with catkins, hatchlings rest at ease. Follow on their secrets, lie down, feel the breeze. Stay under the willow, believe in sacred signs, fantasies you long for, will come true in time. Willows near the river, reflections holding hands. They have understandings they don't understand. Brava, brava indeed. Um, what I love about that is that if you've written the exact rhyme scheme that he uses, you could sing super, to the tune of superstition, you could sing that very easily. And I found myself hearing the wah wah guitar running all through that behind me. So you, you're very good about evoking things. I listened to the music again and again and again and got the rhythm in my head when I started to write. And I don't always write in rhyme, but um, this one has quite a bit of rhyme, either in end lines or in internal rhyme too. Yeah, it, it does. I noticed as you were reading, you got some really good emphasis here and there in the right spots. So. You know, we always like to, to watch a professional at work. Um, I have to go back to your phrases that rattle because I take notes as I, as I read and um, I'm going to bounce a couple of them off you if that's all right. Sure. Uh, under, I think the first one that really grabbed me was uh, Story Tower after Sherazad, Arpeggios Gone Rogue, which is this whole anthropomorphic kind of thing going on. And it, I don't know, somehow it's very pleasing. Should I read it? Uh, if you have, if you have time, I'd love to have you do that. Okay, sure. And Arpeggio's Gone Rogue. Uh, this um, poem was written. I was looking at a building across the city, and how each floor had a balcony, and it seemed like similar to uh, Rimsky Korsakov's music of Scheherazade, which tells the story of a woman telling a king story uh, story after story, night after night. And as long as she kept s telling stories, he wouldn't kill her and go on to the next woman. <laughs> yes. Um, so that, that, that start, the start of the content, but um, it's kind of two poems at once, because if you look at the disposition on the page, uh, there it are single lines at the end of each stanza that could be their own poem. So yeah. here we go, story tower. Building story on story, balcony by balcony, windows with blinds, we frame our lives. Four oboes take us forward. We heed recurring themes. A river glow, uh, flows unwinding with currents underneath. The leavings too familiar. Arpeggios gone rogue. Each day a chapter lengthens. Each year, the epic grows. We deflect, we hide in labor. Five trumpets push us on. We raise the shades of morning. A seed becomes a rose. We soften as two harps wrap around the violins. Torment melts to forgiveness. Reprise becomes reprieve. There's a rhythm to our days now. Remorse and anguish end. We know this lilting story. We climb the stairs again. We need 1,000 stories to fall in love so slowly. A tender piccolo's refrain. Standing on balconies, I remain. 
To answer your question, Roger, about, about the arpeggios gone rogue, I was thinking about the nature of his construction and the instruments he used and the kind of musical riffs. And I think arpeggios gone rogue really was a rattle for me. And also a tender piccolos refrain. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the nature of the cadence of the music or the kind of instrument that either tinkles or moans or wails. So yes, that, those were the rattles. Yeah, which is interesting because it just reminded me that one of my very uh, seventh grade teachers rang my bell when he read uh, Poe's Bells with a tinkling, the tintinabulation of the bells, bells, bells. Like it's awakening moment. You say, oh, this is music in words. Yes. So. I've had a friend called Poetry Mouth Music. Ah, okay. I like that. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? It is, it is indeed. Oh, I'm going to bounce all over the place because there's so much. And for a slender volume, this is, how shall I say it, rich, packed, um, full of tons of meaning. And you can go back and, and look through this again and again and find things. But a couple of things that occurred to me was I was really intrigued uh, by the Garden of Earthly Delights. Um, your decision to not experience in the way the author may, or the artist maybe wanted you by coming from the left side to the right as if you're like reading Hebrew or something. Tell me about that. Oh, okay. Um, yes, well, that's the oldest um, artist represented in the book, Hieronymus Bosch, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, going way, 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 way back. And um, he was commissioned to build a triptych and pe people think it was for a church, but actually, even though he dealt with some kind of religious symbols, I thought it was uh, a much bigger range of things. And I had been studying Arabic, which goes from right to left as he Hebrew does. Yeah. And I thought, okay, so what if you looked at this triptych that's supposed to be um, just a terrifying ride through bad behavior that brings you to a terrible end in terms of religion. And I looked at it from what was supposed to be the most horrifying panel coming back to the middle. And then the first one looked quite benevolent. And uh, so, yes, it's exactly what you said, reading left, uh, uh, right to left, staring, staring, staring. And there's a lot of beautiful design and color and um, animal imagery, as well as human beings doing what might seem like uh, very odd physical and sexual acts. But I think it's as much for him about the design mm -hmm. and the shape of the actual triptych as it is about his story. And he brings up a lot of questions. Yeah, well, it's interesting to contrast that with uh, in uh, Between States uh, about uh, Joan Danzig. You write that the sculptor invites me to make my own myth, which is a collaborative thing. And here you've refused the collaboration he's suggesting to you for your own interpretation. And I find that interesting as well. Uh, Thank you. Fun, fun stuff up here. <laughs> well, it, it is, it is. And, and okay, I have to say, I'm going to get a little meta on you here because you have two poems that are of paintings that are about dance. So it's art, one art form interpreting another art form that has already interpreted another art form. Uh, that's got to be a conscious connection on your part, right? Absolutely. Well, um, one thing you know that I think has really, really affected me and influenced me through life, not only in my poetry but just in living, um, is that. Uh, I lived overseas. My parents took my sister and, and me uh, to first to France when I was two till four and then to India. And we lived there between the time I was four and 14. And my mother was a dancer, opened a dance school. And she and I also studied Bharatanatyam, which is classical Indian dance. And then when I came back to find out what it really meant to be American, I studied modern dance and tap and mime and clowning. And 
<laughs> so yes, that's why dance continues to have a fascination for me. And uh, I do think that, of course, so, so much related to music. And now there is so much spoken word incorporated into choreography, mm -hmm. uh, starting with people like Meredith Monk and Trisha Brown. But now uh, there are so many choreographers who have their dancers not only moving in a space, but speaking uh, sometimes with stage sets behind them that move. I think that's one of the trends we see in a number of things, the mishmash, the uh, the blend of different art, ed, making perhaps new forms out of that and uh, not putting everything in little silos like it was before. One thing that I have on my website, Roger, that um, your guests might be interested in looking at is a poem about the new immersive Van Gogh exhibit. Ah. which is totally multimedia. You walk in and there are, well, it's different in every city, but huge spaces. And in each space, the imagery uh, originally painted or drawn uh, or, or even some words spoken um, are all over the ceiling, the walls, the floors, right there, that's a dance in and of itself. And the, the people who did the uh, technology and the 3D animations of his work did a brilliant job, a brilliant job. I thought I was gonna be very turned off because I thought it would be very commercialized and it would be about buying products and everything. It's exquisite, it is intelligent. And you can sit on a pillow in any of the rooms and look up, down, sideways, backwards, forwards, listen to the soundtrack, which is a combination of music, French spoken word by peasants in the country, um, uh, uh, songs by Edith Piaf. Yes. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's fantastic. So uh, there's a wonderful example of art, drama, music, dance, poetry all tumbling around together. Yes, and the images move. We attended that when it was in Portland, uh, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is exquisite, as you put it, as the images move and flow and the sound wraps around you, every direction you look, things are going on and it's just magnificent. Well, uh, speaking of magnificent, uh, you've been pretty magnificent with your time for me today. Is there any, well, two, two more questions. One, what do you hope people will take away when they close the end of the book? Very interesting. I hope people take away two ideas. One is that art can be a little scary and that poetry can be a little scary. But I think that people will see that if they look at anything, whether it's art or nature, and just see what their reactions are. I always ask, what do you notice? What do you wonder? And what do you take away with you? And those three questions just pop people into telling stories and trusting their own ideas. And same with poetry, you know, it, it can be taught in such imaginative ways uh, that I think perhaps reading this book, people will get that notion and maybe it will be contagious. Oh, let's hope so. And then finally, let's mention your website and where people can get the books. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, PoetLeeWoodman.com, that's Poet Lee, L-E-E, -E, Woodman, W-O-O-D-M-A-N, all one word, poet, uh, PoetLeeWoodman.com. It has a number of poems on it that have been published. And so I actually uh, perform them on, on the website. Each book, each four of the four books uh, with the end word landscapes has a page of its own with where uh, it's available to uh, look at and uh, buy. And then there's some background on other poets I admire and uh, my own um, bio, so uh, poetleewoodman.com. All right. 
You've been so generous and so fun to talk with. I, I can see this is, you're a pro. It's always nice to work with professionals. Uh, our guest today has been Lee Woodman. The book is Artscape. Highly recommended. Thank you so much for your time today. And thank you, Roger. You're the pro.